hello everyone. Uh, welcome to the AMA Hangout session today with Ronnie Sruwala. Uh, so just to give you a brief introduction today, uh, this is going to be an Ask Me Anything to Ronnie Sruwala. And um, to give you an introduction, it, it's absolutely this. Everyone since knows Ronnie already. Just to give a brief, he is also the co-founder and chairman of Upgrad. So I hope you do have a lot of questions that you want to ask him regarding your entrepreneurial journey. And so you could please post your questions on the chat box and I will be pushing them over to Ronnie. So Ronnie, over to you. Hi. Hi, good evening, everyone. And thanks for joining in on this one. Um, over the next you know, 30, 45 minutes, um, what I want to do is spend the first five minutes <coughs> just talking a little bit about um, Upgrad because I think you'll have joined in here, so I think it, you know, in a, in a more general sense. Then I think I've got a a, a good set of uh, interesting questions, and I'm going to sort of pick a few from there, and then really throw it open to everyone for questions and answers. Um, I guess when we were looking at specifically the entrepreneurship course for Upgrad, uh, the big question that everyone was asking us was, can entrepreneurship actually be taught? Now, the answer can be a simple yes. It can also be a simple no. And the no parts, of course, are the fact is that at the end of the day, uh, you know, your risk-taking ability, your conviction in yourself, and your ability to take the course of being an entrepreneur uh, is really something that only you can drive and decide. However, there are many other factors that go into being an entrepreneur and to being a successful entrepreneur over a, over a period of time. And I think <clears throat> what we've tried to do in this very specifically designed three-month course is to give you that clarity, to give you that conviction, to give you that confidence on one side. It's also, I, I think, you know, my the best way I can describe it is that if we can save you um, 20 learning lessons over the first one to two years of your entrepreneurial journey, uh, many of them may be expensive learning lessons, number one. If we can pose to you 20, 30, 40 questions that you would not be able to even have asked yourself on entrepreneurship, on vision statement, on, on everything else, I think that's time well spent. Um, the good part, of, of, of course, of doing an online program is we need you, know, to devote, you to devote five to six to seven hours a week. It's extremely interactive. The good part about the online program also is literally everyone knows who else is on the program. So most people think online is a very anonymous medium where I can come in, I can go out, or oh, I don't know my peers, I'm not networking. And I think we spent our technology platform and everything else allows us to let really everyone know everybody else. And I think that's also a huge uh, development as far as that goes. And I think we brought bro broken up the broad segments into sort of what I would call idea validation into scaling up and into finance and legal uh, and so basically the you know the first segment or the first four weeks is more about the vision statement and um, you know evaluating the business model and all of that the decision thinking and and you know the the the, the entire overall thinking of, of of entrepreneurship the scaling up which i think is really the big challenge for most people you come in you have a great idea but then how do you build it and i don't mean scaling up means even massive of course that's that's great is about really you know the elements that go into that the, the consumer understanding the consumer and consumer centricness marketing focus on sales digital marketing the overall element of building a team because for a lot of people the big question is you know how do i attract talent at what stage do i attract talent <coughs> without money how do i do that etc cetera, etc cetera. and then the third one is really the entire operations the building the legal foundation, building the financial foundation, which most people almost think, oh, you know, when I'm a startup, those are not things that are important. But they vary because most people who want to get invested want to feel they're coming into people who can build a, com a proper company. And then, of course, the elements of pitching, positioning, communication in allow to allow you to, to fundraise. Um, you know, and I think that's sort of the broad spectrum there. So it's it's a well thought through one. Uh, we've kept it about three months, uh, you know, 15 weeks at the, at the tops. Uh, very interactive, very, very interactive. And I think we've been extremely privileged uh, to, to really have um, 
a, a, a phenomenal group of other entrepreneurs who've been very good to give us their case studies on this program. So for the first time, you're going to see live case studies where people are going to talk about their experiences, a lot about their failures, about their crossroads when they were either studying or did they wanted to finish an MBA or did they skip an MBA and do it or how important MBA is, how important is idea validation, how important was research, how important was marketing, what were the things that were challenging for them in fundraising and so on and so forth. So I think that's the sort of overview for those of you all who finally uh, choose to decide to do this program. I think it's an interesting one for going forward. And to sort of summarize that, I would only say uh, <coughs> it's more about uh, the questions that we can pose to you that you don't really haven't thought through when you've become an entrepreneur or want to become an entrepreneur or already are an entrepreneur. And can we save you 20 mistakes, 30 mistakes, and learning lessons over the next uh, one year of your career? And I think the answers are yes. So I'm going to jump into some questions before we then throw it open, because I think that's really where it gets interesting. Uh, and I think you know some of the questions were, how does one think of entrepreneurship while doing a job, is a question. And I guess my simple answer is, you know, you've got to be able to take that call. Now, for a lot of people, it's a tough one. Because you're in a job, you know what's eating you up is you want to start something on your own, but you don't want to give up your job because you don't want to give up the security of the job. But the fact is that that's your first decision of risk taking that you'll have to take over a period of time. It's tough, but believe me, you'll be making a lot more tougher decisions afterwards. So the first point is two things. One, you're not doing your job a fair chance and you're going to be torn. Second, do you really think you can experiment on your idea and do justice to you giving yourself that entrepreneurial journey uh, if you're not taking that call and third do you not realize that this might be your most simplest call you might take though at that point it sounds like the most difficult call because you're letting go of financial security <coughs> in order to start looking at entrepreneurship but i'm afraid there isn't a halfway house in that it's a tough one maybe if you're sitting on the fence too long Chances are you need to evaluate whether you are really going to be able to uh, be ready to be an entrepreneur and take the risk for being an entrepreneur because that's what it requires for it to be done. Another question connected to that came in, what according to you is more important to succeed, passion or hard work? You know, I think passion is this very misused word. Uh, everyone has passion. It's not one unique commodity. Professionals have passion. You study, you have passion. When you want to do a sport, you have passion. So I think when you're starting up uh, even a, your own business or being a professional, if you want to be a lawyer or a doctor or anything else, it's a given that you're going to have passion. It's an overrated word, in my opinion, because to me, it's basic housekeeping. If you don't have that passion, how are you going to be able to move forward? Hard work is a given. But you know, for a lot of people, hard work seems to be one of those situations where, oh, I need to do all tasks. I need to do 14 to 16 hours a day. No, I think it's more now today in the 21st century about smart work rather than hard work. There's no shortcut to hard work. There's no shortcut to your investment in time. But I think it's much more about the smart work that goes into that. <coughs> and another interconnected one was, how do you find great ideas and implement that implement them to build a startup? I think, um, you know, how do you find great ideas and implement them to build a startup? Again. I would just go two steps back and say, firstly, um, when you've thought about your idea, and for a lot of people, the impulse is, I've got a good idea, and then you feel everything else will fall into place. Now, firstly, your own description of, a, of it being a good idea is not good enough because it needs validation. There are many ways you can get that validation. Obviously, you need to make do some homework about the sector you're entering into and how big that is. The second is, are you being able to attract any co-founders are you being able to attract even the first two three members of your staff because that's also a validation of whether you think your idea is a good idea in that context and a lot of that is also to do with timing so i think it's not really about great ideas it's about your conviction in yourself first more than even the idea <coughs> to see it through and let it go um the next one is why do indian investors generally invest in iitns and iims without asking them much about traction, even in the initial stage. Um, well, I don't think that's necessarily statistically true. Uh, I can tell you that out of the investments that I've made, not once have I asked, firstly, somebody, what's your CV and what's your, what's your degree? Um, it really, really depends on the entrepreneur. 
you know, solution-oriented approach of the entrepreneur, um, their conviction to be able to take their step and go forward, the kind of team they've assembled there, those are the ones. I think the concept of IIT uh, and think com it comes in because they're good, strong training grounds for technology, uh, and the and the drill and the and the rigor that you go through, um, especially with products that you need to bring about, uh, which are technologically savvy, or you need to be smart. I think gives people a comfort level. You know, it's as much as why do a lot of people in Silicon Valley back people from MIT more than they even do from Howard. Um, because that's a different skill set altogether. You know, the IIMs, I think, is a much more, and I think most investors do know that an entrepreneurial skill is not necessarily linked to an MBA. Because there's a lot that you learn in MBA, phenomenal amount, but there's a lot you need to unlearn for after being an MBA that you also need to do before you start getting into your own business. I have uh, another question. Um, hi, Ronnie. Is it advice to start up on an entrepreneurial journey right after graduation? Or, or do I need to do my management studies? And you know how important I, how important is MBA? <laughs> I think I kind of covered that briefly, but I want to restate: it's a very personal thing. I'm not here advocating uh, post graduation or MBA or not MBA. Um, I think it's a good grounding for a lot of people who feel they're not ready to go out and start something on their own. It forces them to add structure. Um, it treat it teaches you a lot. It also puts a lot of sandboxes around you and puts a lot of things in. in uh, but And sometimes I do believe that you have to be ready to unlearn things that you learned. You know, if you've learned 100 things, I think you'll need to unlearn 50 of them. But still, the other 50 is on the asset side. <coughs> it's your own personal preference whether you believe that that's the two years well spent or the one year really well spent as far as that is goes. Um, then I have one quite open uh, and very frank question from a lady who says I'm a transgender woman from Mangalore since I know uh, since I know and have been in the what she calls the LGBT community uh, and that that's which, which is for a lot of people who don't know that it's the lesbian and gay community I have literally been each letter on that abbreviation and understand the issues I have a startup plan for LGBT market, but whenever I discuss it with my friends, there is a huge opposition about market size and stigma. Even when we apply the world statistics in India, which is 5% of the population is LGBT. Now, isn't 5% of the Indian population a good market size? And isn't LGBT stigma a key to be factored in considering uh, the product or service? So I would say, firstly, I think it's, 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 it's very it's very good that you sort of brought that out into the open and asked such a question. And I would encourage you, because I think you seem to have some strong convictions in that area. And that's the best starting point of starting a business when you think you have start. I would only caution you that, you know, this 5% statistics, uh, um, you know, you have a rural market, you have an urban market. It's also in this segment, how many people want to actually come up and, and talk about it and face it? And whether is it an open market or is it a closed market? It's also a challenge of what's your product and service. It can't be patronizing. It has to be very, very clear. I'm not quite sure that you know what's the product idea that just serves that community that is so exceptional that does not need to be served to anybody else. I think it's also the question and the challenge that you'll practically face is how do you market that? Because there isn't any you know particular platforms or digital platforms that go and reach out only to the gay and lesbian community in India. And therefore, if you're going to use general platforms, to be able to communicate that, A, that might be quite expensive, and B, would that actually create a challenge in the initial stages? So these are just practical challenges. But I still you know, like the fact that you believe very strongly in a market segment. I think you need to test the product. But you'll have challenges in terms of being able to break through into a market. Will retailers stock that stock? You know, um, Is it all going to be online? Is it a product or is it a service? And how is marketing going to be able to do that? So you know, thanks for my patience. I'm not one for for um, to, for for monologues, and I want to now throw this open for questions for the next thirty minutes. Uh, all right, uh, Ronnie, I can just start pushing out the questions. We do have a, quite a lot. Uh, Good. All right. So first off, uh, we have a question from Kanaksha. How do you evaluate the market size of the unorganized market, which mostly works in hard cash without any traces? 
Well, I think it depends on a lot of things. If you're looking at the Kirana stop and you're looking at you know the whole grocery market or the Kirana stores or the FMCG market, it's actually quite it, it you know it's not a hundred percent cash transaction basis in any case. Number two, some of those segments are so large. Uh, that even if you were to look at the top 10% and 15%, you'll find them to be unorganized, but not so off the radar statistically and not so cash oriented in its sector for you not to be able to do that. So if you want to look at every sector, my, my personal suggestion would be first look at the organized sector, of it, which should constitute a base of 15% of it and maybe a high of 30, 40%. Second, if you want to look at the unorganized sector, because you see that as an opportunity, look at the top 10, 15% of that unorganized sector. And I think that will have a lot more statistics and a lot more ability because those people are sitting on the cusp looking to grow. And actually, there's a fair amount of hunger and interest for that unorganized sector for somebody to take them into the organized sector. And we're seeing that. You know, even in the e-commerce space and in the marketplace space, and specifically in shop clues, where we're quite active, for example, where the merchants there are looking. You know, they may be merchants and have traded in a particular manner, but now they, as entrepreneurs and merchants, want to come into the organized sector and get channelized, whether it's in e-commerce and online, whether it's in the marketplace or in any other way. Next. Uh, okay, great. Uh, we have another question. Uh, what is better to get finance from an angel investor or to start low bootstrapped and builds up slowly a lot of that will depend on your business but if you're asking me as a personal preference my personal preference and my personal recommendation it would definitely be bootstrap in the beginning for a number of reasons Num number one you're testing the market um, number two Bootstrapping is going to create the culture and the discipline of that company for a long, long period in time. And it can do you no harm. Third, whatever valuation you would have done it with the angel, you'll only do it better because obviously it's it's something where you've shown an implementation of uh, proof of concept. And therefore, you'll be able to command a better price and a premium and a valuation from that point of view. So if you can afford it, there's no question about it. And I think everyone should realize when they're becoming an entrepreneur, putting in their own money and increasing their own accountability is always an asset. You may want to hedge your bet in the beginning, but imagine, you know, for most people are going to look at you and said, so how much money did you originally put in the business? And you'll say uh, nothing. The first angel investor came and put in. It's a different view. As you go forward and you build your business and, and, and new investors come into you, that's an answer you should be prepared to ask. And if they feel, yeah, in the beginning when I could ill afford it, I put 50,000, 1 lakh, 2 lakhs, 5 lakhs, 10 lakhs, 50 lakhs, whatever it is that amount, I think it'll stand you in good stead. Okay, great. Uh, so we have one other question uh, from Ankita Daga. In today's scenario, entrepreneurship is mostly understood as some e-commerce execution. Does that have does that have to be restricted to that only? I think uh, there's a misnomer, and we read too much into the media that says that entrepreneurship is only about e-commerce. Yes, that's what gets glamorized in the in the in the print medium and in some other medium. <coughs> but today. In sectors like education, in sectors like health, in sectors like waste management, and so in so many different sectors, in manufacturing and many others, there's an incredible amount of funding going there. In fact, today, if you see that in 2016, when the overall appetite is slowing down, that again is the perception that it's slowing down because it's slowing down for some of the sectors where it had really got puffed up. But some of the other sectors like health, education, and many, many other sectors are, are, are inviting and getting a lot of uh, investment and a lot of interest. So no, I, I would urge each and every one of you to not think of entrepreneurship as equal to only digital, new commerce, all things internet or e-commerce activities. OK, uh, there is one more question that we have here. There are times when we have to choose between the benefit of the society and the benefit of the business. Is the benefit of the business supreme, given that it is not unlawful? I'm not sure what that question means. Um, uh, because I, is I don't know what... your situation with Shin Chan. Chin Chan. Yes. OK, so obviously, if it's if it's law, uh, if there's a problem with law, it's out of the question. So if it's unlawful, that's out of the question. But if it's lawful, then we're talking in that domain. I think it's a question of, you know, you can't be the moral police. So there are two aspects to that. If you're saying that uh, is Shin Chan not the best influence for kids in India, uh, but yet you'd run that as a business and then you make money of it from advertising, it's not a protective society. Uh, you know, kids are going to have to be able to balance and grow in that thought process. Actually, we found that the actual impact and the openness that Shinshan brings about as a character, it's a naughty character, whatever else, 
you know, so is Dennis the Menace, so is many other things. You can't live in a protective environment. So I don't think you're doing anything wrong. You're not favoring either the business or that. Then there is the entire element of social entrepreneurship and impact where people think, oh, but if I'm doing, if I'm building hospitals or I'm doing, uh, you know, medical care, uh, then should I be making too much money and do I look at it from a business perspective? <coughs> there again, I feel you need to. Because the fact of the matter is that if you look at it from a business perspective, then you'll think big. If you don't look at it from a business perspective and look at it in the social norm and the good of society, chances are you might just do a 150-bed hospital and then do that for the rest of your life. But you may be capable of doing a 5,000-bed hospital across six cities. But you won't be able to get the funding to do that unless you've also given business its important priority. I hope I've addressed your question in some way. Next. OK, great. Uh, how do you see the startup bubble growing in India? Do, it, do you see it growing, or is there any point of time where it busts? Well, you know, how do I see a bubble growing? I don't see a bubble growing. I mean, a bubble will have to take its own course in time. I think what I would like to say here is that there are two, three aspects. One, yes, there has been a funding fever that came in, and a couple of valuations get aggressive. Those valuations get aggressive because five or 10 investors feel they need to make an investment. And then everyone feels they're going to get left out. And because they feel they're going to get left out, prices go up. So that's one environment. The second, but that normally happens at the top of the pyramid. Then there's a second one where there's an entire angel community that's come out, and there also a lot of people have turned angel investors because they feel, wow, um, you know, if I'm a salary job, but I'm I can save 10 lakhs, let me put it in with a young entrepreneur because guess what, <coughs> I might get higher returns there than even my own job. Um, that ecosystem has grown a lot. And I think there could be a little bit of a bubble there, too, in the sense is there's a lot more people chasing deals than there could be. So if you look at both of them, you know, there is a there is some part that is good, because if you hadn't had that many angel people coming out, you wouldn't have had too much of risk taking ability from entrepreneurs and new entrepreneurs coming about and first generation entrepreneurs coming about. My caution in the bubble is the maturity uh, with entrepreneurs is still very low. The reason why you're becoming an entrepreneur seems to be only if you can get funding, then you'll become an entrepreneur, and that's when it's flawed. Um, but you know there will be some bursts in valuations, but that doesn't mean everything slows down. I don't think it's one of those 2008 mortgage uh, situations of the United States that created a sort of a world calamity, because that was a very forced one, where everyone who had a house was forced to buy two houses more because whatever else. So I think there are always pockets of bubbles. Sometimes it kind of broadens the market, and sometimes uh, it has its own challenges. OK, great. Thank you again. Uh, so we have uh, Lahad Tabde, who's asked a question to us. In the wake of bullish investment investor sentiments that favor hyper-aggressive growth, what do you think is the future? No, I don't. I think the the flaw with uh, the flaw definitely seems to be that if investors come in, all they're coming in is for growth. <clears throat> and I think yes, 2015 gave wrong directions to a lot of entrepreneurs. That says just grow for the sake of growing. Um, most of them, the rhetoric was much more build a balanced business in that thought process. And I think that's where we're heading. So if there's really a correction in 2016, I'm not really worried about the fact that there are less people getting funded and the valuations are not at the top. What I'm most happy about is that there is a focus from investors that are telling entrepreneurs, you build a solid business. We're here to back your vision. Don't start second guessing what we want out of the business. We're here for you. If you're here for us, then we're both in a, in a bit of a problem. Build a profitable business or build a profitable or build a business with a road to profitability, but build a business that you have a, the right vision to go for. Okay. Uh, we also have another question here. Uh, in the investment circles, is B2C looked down upon and considered a risky investment when compared to B2B? No, I think most people actually prefer B2C because that's where the value gets unlocked. And that's where you're in control of your own destiny. Of course, you don't have that fixed margin on day one. But B2B businesses are quite risky also. Firstly, it's very difficult to create brands and value when you're a B2B business because you're subservient on somebody else. Second, B2B businesses run the risk because you're actually creating capacity and demand with keeping in mind somebody else's need for the product or service. And the chances are that you can't second guess what they're doing. But if they have a problem or that sector has a problem, your business is at full risk. So by and large, people do prefer B2C. 
of course it's risky because it's you're out there in the open and may flop of all this but i don't think b2b is less risky but in the risk and reward ratio i think b2c stands out okay uh we have nirupam srivastava has asked quite a interesting question uh what steps should one be taking uh, before plunging into and starting a startup uh, do you suggest that a safety net should be set up also well i don't know about a safety net but i think this, this the, it's you know at the fundamental level one what's your conviction your risk taking ability and your ability to see i'm a problem solver i will be able to get through whatever challenges that come my way second don't look at this as just one short outing uh, where i'm going to try it and if it doesn't work what the hell i can go back to a job if you go with that attitude chances are you're going to go get a job in any case finally because you haven't given it enough time because the minute you set that timeline there is no timeline you don't know when success is going to come your way and you don't know how many times you're going to fail before that you better be ready for that thought process so if you're saying in 6 months if i fail twice i'm out of here chances are i would recommend don't even try it uh so and i think then this the next part is how much of homework have you done on it how much have you been able to get co-founders or team members i'm not recommending co-founders but sometimes it's nice to have them have you been able to get anybody else who has a buy in on your plan and i think the best test is also if you can put some of your own resources and take that risk because it'll increase the accountability of you in that business and in the long run people will have remember that okay or uh, we also have another question from gaurav ranjan gaurav has asked us uh, how credible is the online resources always to estimate about the market size or is the offline approach to estimate market size preferable well the online is giving you a good amount of data analytics and a good amount of um, of of feedback today if you ask me uh, the good part about online is <coughs> it's all there the statistics is all there uh, there's enough data for you to mine So I think online is giving you a lot more data. Offline, because of the unorganized and organized sector in many else's, and because of historical data, you may actually find that that's more uh, vague. But online, because every transaction is pretty much there and fully accounted for, um, the consumer trends are accounted for. Repeat buying, uh, you know, the ability for a well-managed online company to give you cohorts uh, right off the cuff are much better than. a normal small not to organize offline player that may need to struggle with their cohorts okay uh we have puneet kush who has asked us a question at the very beginning i believe we had just skipped it but uh if i'm not from a tier 1 school and start building an idea uh, then what will be the investors reactions a positive one or a negative one i would say it's not negative uh you know positive is then going to depend on you and whatever else but i would not i would say it's definitely not negative i think people are respecting the fact that people having com- have uh, have coming from a smaller uh, town or not the top 4 or 5 towns um actually have a completely different mindset uh, have a very uh, important aspect in terms of um, cost structures uh, they come with a very strong and a closer consumer behavior understanding because otherwise most people sitting in those big cities have a view that the whole of india behaves that way whereas actually people sitting in the smaller towns have a different view so i would say it's not negative at all and it could be positive but then a lot of that depends on the idea the market size where you want to play what you what you want to do okay uh, we also have another question uh, can entrepreneurship be taught without mentoring you know for me mentoring is asking questions mentoring is not about giving advice i would caution you that if you got a mentor who's constantly giving you advice evaluate the fact that how is a mentor going to be able to constantly give you advice when he's not that closely associated because when you i i don't normally go out and give advice the best i can do after sitting down with somebody and hearing their challenge or their problem is ask them 20, 10 or 15 more questions questions that they would he or she would not have asked themselves and get them thinking i would hear their answers once i hear their answers uh, i would ask them the next question based on that and that's what gets mentoring going and i think that's the way to look at it okay uh amit shah has uh, retweeted again and asked another question what is uh, ronnie's thoughts on offline media content and on the distribution platform not the video on demand platform where internet is the problem in indian market so what what's what's must my view on what I believe, offline uh, he, uh he's just asking about offline media content versus the video on demand platform which is taking more amount of uh, hits today 
so offline would mean what television and broadcasting i'm not quite sure what he means because what's offline offline mediums radio is offline television is offline they're still very very large they're still huge the big challenge is that they're advertising dependent uh, but you know that's how it stays that's how it remains as that is concerned i think digital is picking up uh, bandwidth will in the next 2 3 years will do that so i'm sure, sorry uh, you know maybe you want to circle around and be a little bit more specific about the question but if offline is television i think it's huge i think sports everything else grows because of television it's not imp you can't launch a kabaddi or a football without television okay we have another question here uh in the field like urban farming uh, where they can't be sure of where they can't be a sure shot or a guaranteed product as long as it depends upon natural parameters how do we go ahead in building customer expectations while marketing and building the idea so again not sure if i fully understood your question but here's here's my answer i think the question is firstly there's a lot of agri product going around so let's be very clear if you're building a brand and you're supplying bananas pears pomegranates pineapple tomatoes potatoes uh, or anything that you think is going to have a branded part um you're in the aggregation space you know and india doesn't always go through such a drought need state so you know you buy from madhya pradesh you can buy from somewhere else you're in the aggregation business so if you're if you're creating a brand out of anything else in agri and you're in the aggregation business you need to know enough about the markets because there'll always be some place where it'll get done second i think today more than ever we're a country where you know things like drip irrigation and other technologies that need to get into agriculture have not really come about and drip irrigation does exactly that you know it it allows you to use one tenth of the water requirements and therefore consume some of those natural resources and it, uh, the vagaries therefore of weather and some of act of god are actually diminished when people do that so if you want to really build a business around that and you want to engage with your farmer community work with them to figure out how they can be getting less and less dependent on natural resources or acts of god and invest more in technology and drip irrigation and others okay uh, we have another question uh, as an entrepreneur what what caution should one take while approaching an investor for funding what are the terms and condition one should agree which will not scuttle the company's growth in the future yeah it's it's too broad a question i'm sorry i'm not going to be able to answer it in a specific part i think the main broad parameter is that an investor needs rights if he's investing more than 5 to 10 to 15 to 20% i think he needs the rights i think you need to give that investor the right respect that if you if you what does he want to know he just wants to know that you're not going to take money out of the company that are the, that there no related party transactions where you are going to uh where your entire 100% focus of your business is in that business and you're not going to do any part time job anywhere else uh that you're not going to suddenly dilute his shareholding down and therefore um the ability to then raise capital is with his concurrence and with his approval and that you'll give him a reasonable exit at the end of the day and i think that's really what the investor is looking for outside of that he's not looking to run the company because then you got the wrong investor in there because if the investor hasn't come in to back you to run your company and your vision and your business chances are you got the wrong uh, investor in any case okay uh, we also have a a, a request on advice uh, please advise on the capex heavy business for bootstrapping them is difficult and time consuming and they are typically fundable businesses any suggestions on how to scale up well i think if it is capex intensive then you need to be very clear that the risks you're taking when you're making that capital investment up front <clears throat> so there is a lot of investment obviously the risk is all up front because you're making those investments into the capital assets if it is capital intensive and it's capital asset you can look at a mix of equity and debt because debt is available if people if the banks um or are, are clear that this is collateral that is of a liquid nature and of a good asset that if something were to go wrong they can sell it somewhere else plus they would then need to understand your business model and plan um and i think you know if there's no reason to necessarily bootstrap but at the same time you may decide i want to get in for the best of technology so you might want to trade off between i want to get in the best of technology but maybe you want to then try out on scale or you want to go for scale but you don't want to go for the most expensive technology you have to figure out some of those pros and cons but i think a good mix of debt and equity can also work help uh, help for you um 
at that early stage. But but be remember that the risk element when you're making such investments upfront is you better be sure you've got a marketable idea. Okay, all right. Uh, we have Silesh Ranwal that has asked us a question. Uh, which will be better to start an e-commerce business marketplace model or a hyper-local market? You know, when you ask some questions like that, I think the question you need to ask yourself is, what do you want to build? Uh, you know, this is not a book which you'll open up and say, ah, marketplace, vertical or hyper-local. Uh, if you tell me marketplace, I'll go for marketplace. No, what are your core strengths? They're all they're all different environments that are go. They're already very very competitive. Most places have been taken there. You need to find out what is your conviction in the business idea that you want to do. Number one and two, what are you offering as your differentiator? If you're one more of the people, it it really does make a difference whether you go for marketplace or not because it's going to be a tough one whichever way you do that. So. <laughs> if you're thinking of e-commerce because you keep reading uh, in the media that e-commerce is the right way to go, think twice. If you think that you're going with a marketplace model because that's what you think is fashionable, you could be just to the time when it's becoming unfashionable for you to come in or you could be entering the most crowded space going. Be clear what is the business you want to build, what is the business you are most capable of, of running, and what is the business in which you have a clear differentiator. Okay. We'll take uh, three more questions. Sure. All right. Uh, so we have a question. Uh, will crowdfunding be the way forward for people, for those who need money for initial prototype or building? You know, crowdfunding hasn't caught on in India because there's a big credibility issue because two things happen with crowdfunding. One, uh, you need to feel gratified. The people are coming in there for crowdfunding because they need to feel gratified. And it's very difficult to understand that on the online medium. Second, uh, if you're crowdfunding in terms of equity, you're getting people for which they need a return. There are two elements of crowdfunding. Somebody puts in 10 rupees and it goes to charity, or somebody puts in 10 rupees <coughs> and they get gratified for it. But there's no return required. That 10 rupees doesn't have to be returned or been given with returns. The, but I think if you're looking at crowdfunding, you're looking at crowdfunding for an idea where I want to raise 10 lakhs in my business and I'm going to crowdfund it. Well, today, the regulatory authorities, which is the Security and Exchange Board of India, SEBI, does not allow that. It's under restrictions of that. So crowdfunding for the purpose of equity returns or anything that doesn't have any financial gratification. Ecosystem. A brilliant idea. What is more? Already has uh, a very large. Yeah, sorry. Something came in the middle. OK, I believe there was a small uh, cut on the call. But yeah. yes, uh, so may you continue with an answer? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm saying there, has, yeah. uh, there are regulations that govern crowdsourcing when it comes to equity. So be careful about that part. But I still think overall crowdsourcing is very, very new in India, very early days. OK, uh, so the question that uh, Avinash has posted, hi, Ronnie, do you think online to offline offerings have potential in India? sourcing uh, users online and driving the users to brick and mortar stores? Um, they could. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If that your objective of your business is to build the offline business and, and use online as a marketing play, it could. But then it's much more a marketing play and a digital play. But you know, uh, in a company like Lenskart, where we're very active, we found that using offline to drive people to come online has worked incredibly successful for us. Uh, and therefore, you know, we have a touch point where people feel, OK, I'm going to buy specs, but how do I know whether the frame is going to fit me, et cetera, et cetera. So we've created you know, outlets and home visits for people to go to have their eye checkups done. And we've had incredible success with that because basically, but we don't allow them to buy offline. You, you have a touch point offline, but you have to go back and experience it online. And therefore, we're converting people who would never go online, online. Last question? Yes. Uh, so our last question will be uh, from Gaurav Ranjan. He's asked us, how crucial is the USP for the investors? That is, will it be more advantageous to focus it for a social cause or a more monetizable one? No, I think let's be very clear. All investors are looking for a monetizable one. But let's be also very clear, that does not mean that social means not impactful. I'm saying people are funding big time into education and health, just to give you two, and both of them are high impact sectors. You're changing lives, you're, you're impacting lives in a very, very positive manner. The, the myth is that if you do it for that 
context or if you run a micro financing business or if you run a micro housing financing business the myth is that you need to do it for less profit no in fact the more you do it for profit you're already serving a need because the need you're serving is not a subsidized loan the need you're serving for in, in micro housing finance or microfinance for example <coughs> is that you're giving a loan to people who cannot get it any other way and that's a bigger need than giving it to them at 12% instead of 14%. But when you give it for the right market value, the ability for you to raise funds and give loans to 2 million people who really need it versus 200,000 people who need it, that's going to be your difference. So just want to thank everyone for participating on this call. I believe we had more than 120, 125 people that logged on today. Thank you very much. And hopefully we'll see some of you on an upgrade program very soon. Thank you and bye. Thank, thank you again, Ronnie. Have a good day. Uh, so thank you once again, everyone, for participating in the session today and posting those amazing questions. Uh, for more information regarding the other events that are being hosted uh, for the Saturday events in Mumbai and Bangalore and the Sunday one in Delhi, you can always check us out at upgrad.com slash entrepreneurship slash hashtag meet us. It is available in the description. Uh, you can always click on the link and check us out. Thank you once again, everyone, and have a great day. Seriously?